You see, that's when all the magic happened. I mean, honestly, people look at the life of Paul and we, and we like scratch our heads. How did that guy, what did that, I mean, how did he live like, I can't, how can it be? Right? And what Paul's saying there is, he saw there was a wisdom contained in Christ crucified. Christ crucified means Christ nailed to a tree. He said there's a wisdom contained there that is the power of God. The power of God. Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, there's a wisdom there that is the power of God. And he said, I began being intimate with the wisdom that was revealed at Christ crucified. And it did something in me where it conformed the persuasion or the belief in my heart to the faith of the Son of God. And that caused me to do just like the Son of God did on the cross where he gave up the ghost and he laid down the life he had from the world. It brought something forth in me where I considered what I could gain from the world as worthless, as dung, as vanity of vanities, as Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes. I saw they were empty. They looked good. They looked good for food. They looked like it could make me wise towards the end of attaining to life. But then I realized they weren't good for food. They were rotten. And because they're rotten, I stopped eating from there. I mean, who wants to eat rotten fruit? I mean, listen, I bought this, uh, this creamer for Cindy a couple weeks ago because I thought it was the kind of creamer that she wanted. And it turns out that it wasn't. Well, we come in here and have the Bible study here Monday mornings now, and I brought that creamer out. Well, I left Monday morning and just left the creamer sitting out. You know, the, the whole big bottle of this expensive creamer. Don't you know, in my mind, I was thinking it's still good. We can still drink that. So I smell it. I'm like, ooh, I don't know. So I was like, let me go put it in the fridge and see if it gets better after it's cold for a while. And so, listen, guys, for the last, I hadn't, I hadn't served it to anyone because I know it's rotten. And you don't want to eat and drink something that you know is rotten. But for the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to talk myself into, just use it. Just see if it'll work. See if you're okay. And listen, I don't find the ability to drink it. Do you know why? Because there's something inside of me that says it's rotten. There's something inside of me that says it can't make me feel good. It's not going to be nice for my coffee. It's actually going to bring me death and destruction. So I've laid it down. Do you see what I'm saying? Amen. You guys are thinking, well, thank goodness you didn't test your little experiment out on us. <laughs> and <laughs> these poor guys that come here now are going to, every time they're over there, is this that stuff Greg had out here? <laughs> now listen, man, I'll throw it away. <laughs> uh, you see, that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about there, that the world has a life to offer. And when the world offers you a life, it wraps it up in a pretty bow. And it promises you intimacy with peace and love and joy. And Paul said, he saw something at the cross that revealed that the best the world could offer him was death and destruction. And he said he received strength from that, wisdom, to lay down the life he had from the world. God brought something forth in him where he gave up the ghost. And just as Jesus experienced resurrection inside of human flesh after he gave up the ghost, Paul is describing the death and the resurrection of Jesus happening in him even while he's still walking in the world. And that's how it goes down for all of us. That's why God poured out the Spirit of His Son. God poured out the Spirit of His Son so that this, that Spirit could dwell in us and could bring forth the death and the resurrection inside of us even here and now. And so Jesus laid down the life he had from the world. He gave up the ghost. I see God did something in me where I've now counted what I can gain from the world as dung. And I see I've laid down that life and I've given up the ghost. And I realize in that place, I'm now starting to experience the power of the resurrection like Paul said. I counted those things as done for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, that I might know him, that my intimacy might be with him, him and not with the life that's in the world and that I might know the power of the resurrection he says so he lays it all out for us and he says that the foundation from where this all began is Christ crucified in the wisdom that was revealed at the cross right something I see in the church it doesn't matter how long I've, I've been in the church I mean we are constantly trying to like do away with the power of the cross no no, no we're going to get it out the way and we're going we're gonna to move on now. We either got to move on to build the kingdom ourselves, or we got to move on because the cross isn't where it's at. It's where the resurrection where it's at. And listen, I'm not trying to make little of the resurrection. I think everybody knows I preach about the resurrection as much as, as most people. 
do. But in order, if we got to make little of the cross to make much of the resurrection, then we neither understand the resurrection or the cross. And we, we're getting it twisted. And so I, I just feel to like lay a good foundation again about what's going on in the cross. And, and there's a lot of things we can say about the cross. There's a whole lot of things we could say about the cross. It's the manifold wisdom of God that's being revealed there. And so I'm just going to run down a, a brief synopsis of some of the things we can say at the cross, and I'm going to try to avoid lengthy explanation. Because <laughs> you could spend your whole life trying to unwrap these things. But at, listen, at the cross, Jesus takes the sin of the world upon himself. And what does it mean to take the sin of the world upon himself? It means he took the death that was reigning over the world by one man, Adam, upon himself. He took the death upon himself. He is the lamb God provided to take away the death that was reigning over the world. And that went down at the cross. Jesus came in the likeness of our David. He came in the same likeness that David was to Israel, where David came and stood as an advocate next to the Israelites when Goliath was shaming them and uncovering their nakedness. And David came and slew the giant and severed the head of the giant. Jesus came in the likeness of David, slaying the giant that was the death that stood against us. Goliath is a picture of death standing against us. Death is our giant. How many of us can conquer death? None of us. Well, there we are, wanting to conquer death, wanting to appear as the sons and daughters of God, but now there's this giant that's death standing opposed to us, appearing as the sons and daughters of God, uncovering our nakedness and uncovering our inability to conquer death ourselves, making us feel uh, filled with shame and fear. And then Jesus comes as our David, and he slays the giant that is our death. Jesus crushed the head of the serpent on the cross. The way that he did it, was by taking away the power the serpent had over us through our union to death. The serpent had power over us through our union to death. You notice how Jesus said, now is the hour where the prince of this world is going to come to me, but he has nothing in me. Do you know why the serpent had nothing in Jesus? Because Jesus was braided together with eternal life. And so even though he had a perishable body, a body that could take death into itself, he had eternal life inside of that perishable body. And so the serpent had no power over him because he wasn't married to death. He was married to God and eternal life. And so Jesus destroyed. He crushed the head of the serpent. He took the power the serpent had over us by destroying death, by ending our union to death. The place he ended our union to death was the cross. The resurrection is not about your union to death being ended. The resurrection is about your being joined together with eternal life. The cross is about your union to death being ended. And so, with that being said, we need to understand what even the forgiveness of the sin of sin is. You think 2,000 years after, we would understand these things. But it's okay, right? I'm the chief of all hard-headed people. It's to, listen, I, it's taken me my whole life to figure this stuff out. And God is gracious and compassionate and filled with long-suffering. <laughs> and I promise you, he's had to suffer the longest with me. <laughs> Okay, so glory to God. Everybody else is in a good place. But the sin of the world was forgiven at the cross. Do you know why? Because the forgiveness of sin means to be divorced from something. It means for one party to be divorced from another party. We were married to death in Adam, and it was at the cross that Jesus divorced mankind from their union to death so that we could be free to be joined to God in his eternal life. You have to first be free from your old marriage before you can be married to someone else. Listen, it doesn't matter how much Becky wants to get rid of me. She can't be married to somebody else unless I first die. And we ain't got the money for her to get a hitman. So she's stuck. <laughs> she have to make a whole lot of sauce to, to pay the guy that way. So you see, she's not free to be married to someone else in their life unless her union to me in my life could first be ended. Mankind was the same way. We were married to death in Adam. We weren't free to be married to God in his eternal life. So God had to get it right to first end our union to death. The way he did that and the place he did it was at the cross. He divorced us from our union to death. That's the forgiveness of sin. And now we're free to be joined with God in his eternal life. 
And so what I would want to say is, without the cross, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the resurrection, there is no being joined to eternal life.